Hi everybody, we hope you are enjoying the second day of our coverage of DevX at COP26. I'm joined now by Hindu Omarul Ibrahim, the President of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. And Hindu has been a really vocal activist for the voices of indigenous people around the world, and particularly in, in Africa, in the Sahel. As, the, as it relates to the climate crisis. So thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm going to hand you our microphone. Um, Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. Hindu, could you tell me first of all um, a little bit uh, uh, about yourself and how long have you been advocating for indigenous rights? Sure. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's really a very long time, I can say, because I started since I was a kid. Yeah. Because for me, it is not an issue of being activist or issue of uh, just like uh, you have to take it as a vocation. No, I'm doing it because I grew up in the communities where they are living, depending from the nature, and where the human right is uh, always a big struggle at the communities and where we are living the climate impact. So I can't tell you, like, uh, I started 10 years or 20 years. I can say I started for my entire life. Do you think... Thank you. Why is it important, then, that we're here at the COP in Glasgow and you're here to, to represent Indigenous people? There are other, many other Indigenous representatives from other parts of the world. Why do you think it's important that the COP is uh, an, an inclusive process that includes the voices of Indigenous people? I think for um, the indigenous peoples around the world, maybe we represent only 5% of the world's populations, but we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. So I do not see any COP that talking about nature, talking about the peoples who are contributing in nature without being inclusive to the indigenous peoples and without that having indigenous peoples sit in the tables and also have their own decisions to be there. Indigenous peoples used to be for so long that they're just victimizing us. We are not the victim. We become the victim because of the inaction of the other peoples who are destroying our land, territories, and resources. We are the champion of the climate. We are the solutions makers. So that's why we also refuse to become a victim. We are the solutions, and our participation is really very important to the successful of the COP. Thank you. We had another speaker, Salim Al Hug from Bangladesh. Maybe you know him. He uh, he's a really interesting uh, phrase. Instead of calling people, you know, climate vulnerable people, he used the phrase first adapters. Is that kind of is that something you recognise? Uh, definitely, I know very well. Salim Al Hug is my other brother from um, uh, Bangladesh. But of course, why they just like put as this name like vulnerable populations or? impacted or whatever even we are the most impacted but we are the first one who are adapting we do have the knowledge we didn't ask for anyone we didn't wait for anyone we are adapting are all indigenous peoples around the world so definitely i agree with what salim al haq said do you think uh, people in the global north ngos the media need to be a bit more careful about how you know they refer to communities or adapting to the impacts of, of climate change. Is there a bit of a, a narrative issue that you, um, you think needs to change? I think this narrative must change, not just have to change, it must change. And they have to stop to just babysitting the peoples from the global south or especially the indigenous communities saying like, we are there to help you, we are there to work. No, we are there to help you. If we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity, you are not helping us. We are helping you. So it is time that to do it together. We are not asking them to come and just like give us the support. We are asking that how we can do this work together, how everyone can take his responsibility. People from the global north, they must take the responsibility to reduce the emissions. They are the one who took us in this pathway of climate impact. So they are also must be the one who will reduce the emissions, who think about their own self. We are impacted, but we are adapting. So they must learn from us. So it is a partnership work. And that's why the naming of negative way have to change. We are the champion and everyone must recognize that.
Do you have some ideas for how you know indigenous communities and organisations and institutions representing the global north can work together more fair, more fairly and in a better way to try and preserve biodiversity in a way that kind of promotes climate justice? I think the first thing that the global north might do, they must recognise and respect the indigenous people's rights. They must include the human rights based approach in all the climate decision and climate implementation. Because for us, it is not a matter of mitigation, how we can just reduce the carbon and invest in the carbon. It is a matter of adaptation. And when we talk about adaptation, we also talk about the human rights, right to water, because our water are polluted right to clean air because even the global north have a polluted air where they're breathing it is a matter of development because we also deserve to develop to have our own way of development not imposed way that's coming from the global north that change all our uh, life we want our own development based on renewable energies based on traditional knowledge of the indigenous communities based on um, uh, family ag agriculture sustainable way of living social way of uh, sharing all together, supporting each other. So they must understand and put the human rights there. Secondly, they must understand the participation is not meaning just to you call the global south, come and sit down and then the global north take the decisions. No. Being partners, it's sitting together, taking the decision together, listening from each other. And thus the global north do not know that because most of the time at the negotiation, they get the capacity to have all the experts that they want. It's not the case of the Global South. The language barriers is not the case. So how they can just uh, sit in the back and have all these communities to be there, to get them voice, to listen and implement. And lastly, it is a matter of how we can implement. Implementation needs finance. We are not begging to get the finance. They are the ones from the Global North who, who take all the opportunities of the finance to develop themselves. So it is time that they return this finance back to our peoples, to our communities, to help fix the problem that they make. And for that, we do not want to have commitment. We want to have the cash in the tables. We do not want them to set the criteria. <laughs> they are not holding us, no. They must make this money adapt to our realities. So the money must adapt to us, not we must adapt to the criteria that they put in the money. And then we can be equal and we can start talk together. So loud and clear, human rights need to be enshrined as part of this process for you, but also the money needs to be accessible. That's a big issue. That's Absolutely, that's a really big issue that's been talked about a lot by this thing. How have you been impressed or uh, what have you what have you been impressions of the UK as host of this COP? Do you think they have effectively facilitated participation in a meaningful way? What are your thoughts? Let me be clear. Let me be clear. After this pandemic, it is the first bigger conference that the world has. So we must all understand UK did the best. Because having the peoples coming from everywhere, wearing the mask, being sure that they are not contaminating each other, being sure that everyone get their place in the room, this is one of the challenging things and that UK did it. And then they are improving it. So they are the first one, so we cannot blame them. We must help them. However, there is something that they must also improve. Participations. We still have some of the peoples who didn't get their passport for the visa. They travel, they put all the money, all the energy to get the visa to another country. But two months, they didn't get it. For those who get the visa, who come here, all the COVID tests, all the orientation are in English 100%. From the people who speak Spanish, who speak French, how they can just to wake up every morning and do the daily test and go through a website mm -hmm. who is 100% English and follow the instruction and doing it? <laughs> I mean, for, for me, it's difficult. How much for the French speaker, Arabic speaker, Spanish speakers, and it is an inclusive, so it is not only limited to the English peoples. And it is the same when you wanted to ask your way or when you wanted to book something, when you pass through the airport, everything 
it's not facilitated for the people who are coming from the outside who are not native English speakers. Of course, we understand UK is the mother of English, but we are not. I have my mother tongue. If like I take some peoples from UK or US or whatever, I take them to my community, I'm like, be there, sit there. They do not understand my language. They do not understand my culture. I really would, would love to see their faces just to be there for one day. But we are here for the two or three weeks for some of us with this struggle. So the next COP must learn from this one in order to improve the inclusiveness. And making inclusiveness, it's not also limited to those logistics. We have at the negotiations how the inclusiveness must be also open. So the rooms must be biggest, where everyone can have the place to sit, not only having the daily pass. Of course, this one also we understand. It is the first one we are making it, but it must be improved better. So you, you say you've been a lifelong activist for indigenous rights. Do you think that the, uh, the, the perception of indigenous rights is being taken more seriously uh, in, 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 in this COP and in more recent years? Is the situation better now than it has been, you think, in the past? So the, f the first recognition is COP21 in Paris, because after 20 years before Paris, there was a struggle of recognizing of indigenous people's rights. And for the first time, we got five references into the Paris Agreement, from our knowledge to our rights to our participations. This was the beginning. And then we come back uh, progressively to have the local communities and indigenous people's platform that have been implemented with a unique body in all the world in the UN agencies, where we have the equal representations within this climate change, seven from the government, seven from indigenous peoples, even in the leadership role, we co-chair, and that's why I'm the co-chair of the facilitative working group for the local communities and indigenous peoples, uh, for the indigenous peoples part. And my other co-chair is from the government, he's from Canada. So then we chair this power, of uh, discussions, of input, as indigenous peoples, all our seven social cultural regions. It is a big step too. And we come here in the COP26, we have our negotiations item who already adopted. That's the other good thing. We get the indigenous people's commitment on 1.7 billion for forest and land. This is also a big step. So participation is getting improved. But my issue is, we don't have time. We are in urgency. So we cannot anymore accept the small step. It is important, but we need to do a bigger step. And bigger step mean for me is sitting in the tables, taking the decision together, not just to talking from the outside. It is also having the commitment, yes, but turning very quickly the a mechanism that can give this direct access to the funding to my mother, to my grandmother, to my uh, cousin, to all the indigenous peoples around the world who are at the communities, who are doing the action. So we cannot wait until the next years to do one mechanism and the another year, another one. So we need to do it now and hopefully by the next COP in my region in Africa, we can come up with a good solutions or with a good improvement of how indigenous peoples are better participating. Just quickly, very quickly, before we have to go, there's been a lot of talk about loss and damage. Some people say there's been progress around loss and damage. What's your take on that? For me, the progress in loss and damage must be only if we consider the non-economic loss and damage, because for indigenous peoples, we are losing our identity, our land, our territories, our culture. We are losing the life of our peoples. So those, they cannot pay them. They can put any billions. They cannot pay a life of someone or an identity or a culture. The only way is recognition of the non-economic loss and damage and to recognize they must act to stop the climate change in order to do not have those losses anymore that causing us pain. Hindu, that's been really great to hear you talk. Thank you so much for joining us at, with DevEx at COP26 and thank you all for watching. <laughs>